Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for joining us today um, for uh, our seminar and book launch, uh, Rakhine's Past, Myanmar's Future. I'm Gwen Robinson, uh, editor-at-large of the Nikkei Asian Review and more relevantly, uh, senior fellow at the Institute of Security and International Studies here at Chulalongkorn University. Um, we're very lucky today to have um, an incredible panel of experts uh, on Myanmar and uh, specifically uh, on my right uh, on uh, Rakhine State. And uh, um, as you'll hear from them very shortly, uh, there's a lot to talk about on Rakhine. Uh, so uh, I think you've all got handouts and uh, have read uh, the background of uh, our panel members, but just briefly to uh, recap, Dr. Anthony Ware on my far right is Senior Lecturer, Director of the Australia Myanmar Institute at Deakin University in Melbourne and co-author of the book Myanmar's Rohingya Conflict. To my immediate right is Dr. Costas Laotides, Senior Lecturer at Deakin University, um, also in Melbourne, uh, co-author of uh, the book, Myanmar's Rohingya Conflict. On my left is Dr. Robert Taylor, Emeritus Professor, School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and author of um, many seminal books on Myanmar, including The State in Myanmar, and most recently, um, uh, a very impressive biography of General Ne Win. And next to him is Dr. Tin Mong Mong Tan, Independent Scholar and Associate Fellow at IC's Yusof Ishak Institute in Singapore, who has an extensive background, um, initially way back uh, working as an economist with uh, Myanmar's government in the early years and later at IC's. Um, so um, without further ado, I was going to say a couple of things. One thing I will say is I've been covering Myanmar for many years and a few years ago uh, I ran into Anthony and Costas in uh, the Memory Hotel in Sitwe, hard at it, doing their field work. And I subsequently, when I was covering Rakhine, kept running into them, um, you know, sweaty and in the back blocks and pursuing sort of interviews and doing a lot of on the ground research. So I can, um, I can testify that they were really there and really doing the research. So over to you gentlemen. They will give a short talk um, of about 45 minutes and um, then we'll hear from the discussants and later we will open the floor for questions. So um, please note, uh, note your questions down if you'd like to uh, raise some points later on. Um, so gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gwen. Thank you to the Institute for hosting us and thank you for everybody coming. I'm aware that this is uh, holiday time for particularly those from the Northern Hemisphere, um, expatriates and so on, uh, and the university is closed. So it's, it's fantastic that so many of you have come out. Thank you very much. Um, today, what, we, what I want to do, or what Costas and I will do, is to run through um, some of the key concepts and things that we cover in the book, and then we're very happy to, um, and I should say, the first I saw of a hard copy of the book was two days ago. Um, these are the very first copies to go on sale, um, and they rushed them to us, so they're, they're literally hot off the press, um, but there's still, there's always updates, and there's always things we're happy to, con you know, have a conversation conversation around those as we go. So what I want to cover um, in the first bit um, is just talking through some of the key misconceptions I, that I would see about the conflict, um, the tripartite nature, and I'll unpack that a little bit, and the fact or the way this is an intractable conflict and what that really means for the, the future of the conflict. Um, Costas is then going to talk to us through a few more academic um, analyses, some of the theories of what leads to violence in conflict um, and analyse the Rakhine conflict against some of those. We don't have time to go into in-depth, that's why, you know, um, I, I meant to say this, aren't I? I meant to hold the book up and say you all need to buy this if you want the yeah, detail. Get the message. <laughs> Um, I want to start by, by thanking the Goethe Henkel Foundation uh, and Graceworks Myanmar for providing funding for our research over the last couple of years. Um, and we've, we've, you know, as you see on the slide, I'm not going to read all of what's all, on all of the slides, we're going to flick through some of them fairly quickly, um, but we've put some fairly extensive um, field work in to trying to um, uh, unravel what's really going on on the ground there, starting in 2011 before the, the most recent bout of violence. Um, 
I think we all know where this, uh, you know, where the geography sits. Um, it's you know, along the coastline between Bangladesh and Myanmar. Was its own independent kingdom for a very long time, um, and, and quite independent of um, Myanmar, uh, Burma, uh, Burmese kingdoms. Uh, in many respects, was closer to the, the Muslim sultanates um, as a Buddhist kingdom on the on the edge of Myanmar was closer in many regards to the the Muslim sultanates. Um, the ethnic Rakhine Buddhists arrived about a thousand years ago. There's about two million of them. There were about 1.1 million um, ethnic uh, Rohingya in, in Myanmar uh, at the time of the 2014 census, probably 1.3 million. The big debate at the centre of this in many regards is uh, when did they arrive and do they have a long history in the land or are they recent immigrants? And that's really central to the, the different understandings and we'll unpack that a little bit. The first misconception I want to deal with quite quickly is that this is not a new conflict. And most of the media attention and the international commentary has focused on what's happened since 2012 when there was intercommunal violence and, uh, and then more recently in 2016 and 17. Um, and most of, so most of what most uh, the, uh, know about the conflict without having done a lot of reading uh, is focused on this very recent period. But as you'll see on the slide here, there have been four previous mass exoduses of both Muslims and Buddhists from the northern part of Rakhine State, dating back to, to 1784 when the Burmese took over, but then post-independence, or, or, um, or should I say from World War II on, there's been a, no a number of other clashes um, that sometimes are over-simplistically presented, but, um, but have seen hundreds of thousands of people uh, flee. World War II was particularly significant. Um, with, with massacres and ethnic cleansing on both sides. The Japanese advanced um, in early 1942 to Sitwe, which is the state capital, um, Akyab as it was then, uh, and the British retreated and north of there, between there and the border with what is now Bangladesh, was no man's land and in some senses was almost a proxy war going on um, with the Muslims predominantly on the side of the British and the, the, uh, the local uh, Rakhine on the same side as the Burmese on the same side as the Japanese and there was a lot of intercommunal violence that was connected with the, the overall narratives of World War II at that point. Uh, and fears about um, their impending independence. And I would say that in many respects, um, what we're seeing today is still echoes of unresolved uh, and undealt with ethnic cleansing and genocide that happened on both sides during World War II, um, overlaid by a whole lot of, of other more recent narratives. The second misconception I want to address is that this is not simply a simple oppression of a minority by the state and everybody in it. Um, this is a bit more complicated than that, um, and we'll, we'll unpack that in, in, as we, you know, um, at this. So the, the definitely, you know, 2012, um, 2012 we saw a, a, a bout of intercommunal violence that was predominantly by the local ethnic Rakhine Buddhists and the local Muslim population that, uh, that was mutual in some respects. Certainly the Rohingya Muslims were the worst affected um, because of their vulnerability, but there was violence perpetrated both ways in that conflict. And this was a communal conflict without much weaponry. Mostly it was about burning houses uh, and it resulted in about 140,000 people displaced from their homes into camps. And so that's the first dimension on this. The second that we've heard about in the last year or two, fairly, um, you know, fairly largely, has been between the military and the Rohingya people, uh, and therefore uh, the bigger picture is you know, the, the bottom one on this. Um, the bigger picture is really between the Muslims uh, and the Burman state, um, and I say Burman because uh, I think in the eyes of the Muslims, this is Burman led. This is ethnic Burman led, um, even though the state, of course, is bigger than just the the, the Burman ethnic group. Um, and so in, in, 2000, oops, in 2016 and 17, we see this violence um, that has been all over our TVs and, 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 and newspapers and we've been reading about, that's caused um, you know, 671,500 uh, Rohingya cross the border into Bangladesh in the space of about four or five months. Um, and uh, and it's, been, it's been quite brutal and, uh, and so on. And that's a second dimension um, involving the, the you know, organised violence by the uh, Myanmar state, but also an armed militant, well, kind of armed, 
militant insurgency by the, the um, Arakan Rohingya Solidarity, uh, Salvation Army um, launching attacks against state installations, not against ethnic Rakhine um, villages or leadership, against state institutions. Um, and the third level, if I go forward, uh, and this one is missing from most international analysis, but is the third side of the triangle, is that the ethnic Rakhine Buddhist population have an ongoing and long-standing dispute that is often violent um, with the Myanmar state um, themselves. Um, so uh, you've got pictures there in the t at the top of the Arakan army, an insurgent army that is fighting the government. I'll show you some, some maps in a moment. Um, the, the monks uh, often organise against the government um, and, and um, some incidents down, uh, down the bottom. If you take a look at the map here of the northern half of Rakhine State, bordering Chin State, um, and on the very top left there is, Bank is the Bangladeshi border, for those who don't know the townships in, in Rakhine. So Mangthor was about 93% Muslim, and the southern half has now been cleared of all of the Muslims, and the northern part has, has seen a fairly major exodus. Buddha Tang has lost a good number of the Muslims across the border. Um, but, but just in terms of geography, I mean, this is not a huge distance. We're talking 40 miles or something, 30 or 40 miles between uh, Mount Dol, where all of that was happening, and, uh, and Chok Dol Mrapu that you can see there. Uh, back, in, back in February, January this year, um, the ethnic Rakhine Buddhists were celebrating their 233rd anniversary of being defeated by, or not celebrating, remembering their defeat by the, by the Burmese. A 5,000 strong crowd turned up to protest effectively the government and, 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 and call for greater independence. Two of the ethnic Rakhine leaders were arrested, leading to the crowd to defy the authorities, um, resulting in dozens of um, ethnic Rakhine Buddhist protesters being shot by armed forces, uh, by, by security forces. Um, a dimension that we kind of miss. Um, at, at the same time that the, vi the violence was being perpetrated against Muslims and they, were and they were fleeing across the border into Bangladesh, in Chokdor, uh, 30 odd miles away, um, the Arakan army were launching attacks against the military. Which is why I say this is a bit more complicated and interconnected, because in some ways, and, and often portrayed that the local Buddhists are co co in collusion with the military to drive the Muslims out. And there's not, there, there, there is a truth embedded in that, but it is far more complicated than that. Um, and and we, we need to capture the, the tripartite nature of this, uh, I think, to really get our heads around it. Um, and we try to, at some length in the book, uh, to, to unpack some of the details of recent events so that this becomes quite clear. The third misconception that I think is, is very prominent uh, in the wider community that I think we do need to deal with is that this is not about a denial of citizenship and statelessness per se. Now, definitely the vast majority of the Rohingya, almost all of them, are stateless and have been denied citizenship. But I would see that as being more of a consequence of the dynamics of the, con of the conflict than being what the conflict is, is primarily about. And, th and that rather this is a conflict about the, the political community in Myanmar that actually is reflective of the other armed conflicts across the country as well, about federalism and who gets a voice and how much voice and, and the distribution of resources and territory. Only these, the Rohingya are the most disadvantaged and the most marginalised in this whole conversation. But I don't think it's a different problem. It probably needs a different solution or some different handling. But I don't think it's a different question than the fundamental question at the core of Myanmar's problems um, today uh, across the entirety of the country. Okay, I would describe, we would describe this conflict as being an intractable conflict. Now, intractability is, a, is an idea that's been brought out in the literature, particularly by these two authors in the last 20 or so years, particularly developed, partic uh, initially thinking about um, Israel-Palestine and has been applied to a good number of conflicts around the world. So it's kind of a technical, somewhat academic definition in, in many respects. I'm not going to read everything on the slide. I'll let you read all the, all the words there um, if you want. But the, 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 the fundamental thing is that this, this, this type of conflict is a conflict that's been going on for at least a generation. So that uh, successive generations have witnessed um, cyclical bouts of violence and, and heard the stories and felt for themselves 
um, and, and, sent, and developed a sense of a, a, a collective memory about what the, about what the conflict is about. So both sides, or all sides, develop this, this collective memory, this narrative, this historically derived narrative that, that becomes deeply embedded in their, 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 their social beliefs about who they are and who, they, who their other ethnic groups are. Um, and, and that this, this, over the period of at least a generation, if not longer, becomes deeply embedded and, and results in um, collective emotional responses uh, as a way, as much of coping by people living with that protracted sense um, of perceived existential threat. So the point that I'm making here is that all sides in this conflict, including, I would dare to suggest, the army uh, and, and the Burmese state, um, perceive that this conflict poses an existential threat to them and are reacting out of that. Whether we agree with that analysis or not, they think their state or they think the army, they think the Rakhine Buddhist population uh, face an existential threat over this. It's not just the Muslims who feel that way. Uh, and I think it's really quite important that we understand that the depth of that existential kind of threat that they feel. In the book, we go into, into quite some analysis over two chapters of the, the way these historical narratives, these collective memories are expressed, what the, the nature or the shape of these narratives and where they come from, uh, and tracing most of these back um, several hundred years, in fact, but really anchoring them in today. So the first of these is, is the, sorry, the Rohingya's own narrative about themselves. And they, to them, they, their narrative is that they have um, lived in the, in, the, in the land for a very long time. The first wave of migration they would date to over a thousand years ago. And they would date four waves of Muslim migration into the land um, over the six or seven hundred years after that, up until about 300 years ago or so. Some would suggest that they were the controlling or a controlling uh, interest uh, at the head of the, the kingdom in Arakan, in Marakul. Uh, they would suggest that many of the kings were in fact Muslim. Um, there are other Muslims who would say that's probably not the case, but certainly ministers of defence and key, uh, key, key you know, high-level positions in that royal court were Muslim, and they would see a very major Muslim history for the last thousand years, and therefore that they are an indigenous people by Burmese definitions of indigeneity, and they have every right to citizenship as an ethnic group. So that's their basic argument that is embedded in their collective storytelling about the, the distant past and the recent past. The Rakhine dominant narrative about themselves is, um, and we've labelled this in the book, um, their independence narrative, and that is that, that they have long had a, an independent existence for a thousand years independent of, Bama, of, of Burmese. Um, and they, they, they draw very heavily on the, their um, royal chronicles and, um, and, and so on, and they still claim independence from the Burmese state. If you look at the, the last three democratic elections in Myanmar, so 1990 that was never uh, actualised, and then 2010 and 2015, the, the best performing ethnic um, uh, political party in each case um, or one of the best uh, in each case was with, with the Rakhine Party. Um, so they've had various iterations, various uh, form, various names. Uh, if you look at the, the makeup of the, the parliament in Naypyidaw, um, particularly this latest election in 2015 that saw Aung San Suu Kyi come to power um, and, and the NLD, most ethnic minorities decided they would give Aung San Suu Kyi, as a Burmese, a chance to, to help resolve their ethnic issues and believed in her. The one ethnic group that en masse didn't, uh, at least the, the northern half of the rec ethnic Rakhine population. And they, they still believe that they need independence, both politically and militarily. Um, they, they've got this desperate fight um, to gain their independence. The third of these narratives is the Burman unity narrative, as we've called it. Uh, and, that is, and that is really what's at the core, I would say, of the army ethos, uh, particularly the army. Um, and that is, but I would see it as being anchored in the late, um, in the late period before the British colonised the country, and certainly as central to their, their push for independence uh, during uh, shortly after World War II. And that is that, that the ethnic groups in Burma, most of them, 
excluding the Rohingya, but the, almost all the ethnic groups in Burma have a common ancestry and a, and a shared history and that together they need to pull together um, what is often not said but is felt by most of the ethnic minorities, pull together under ethnic Burman leadership and domination almost, but pull together to form a new nation and, and to, to forge a... a, a, a a, 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 um, uh, yeah, to, yeah, to forge a new nation, uh, and, and in, sen in many senses they're still doing that. The, the, the biggest threats perceived by the military uh, is the ideas that the, the, the country could fall under foreign subjugation somehow, that the, the ethnic unity of the country could disintegrate and therefore that the country could disintegrate uh, into many states or the parts of the country could come under control of other, other neighbour states. And so this idea of, of having to hold together as, as ethnic groups that are related um, has been felt by most, including the ethnic Rakhine Buddhists, as being a drive for assimilation and, and obliteration of their own ethnic identity. But, by, but, but in the process, the way this has been shaped, particularly by General Nguyen and, and since 1962 onwards, within the military, has been by um, destroying the distinction against the Muslims, the Indians, the Chinese in the country, many of whom have left, um, and one of those consequences has been that the Rohingya have been labelled as being not Burmese, not of this collection, and therefore external, therefore they must be recent migrants, therefore they can't be part of this unity. Um, and I think this is a central struggle in, 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 that's going on here around the political community. The fourth um, narrative is, um, is, is shared across the Burman and um, ethnic Rakhine. And that is that the Muslims have been and must be infiltrating in large numbers since uh, independence, as well as that the vast majority, if not all of them, um, uh, all of the rest of them, came in during the colonial period, uninvited by us. They might have been brought in, welcomed by the British, but uninvited by us Burmese or, or Rakhine, uh, and therefore that they are infiltrators. And that's a word that's relatively commonly used um, about them. So I won't, I won't go into this, I've been talking too long. Um, yeah, take a photo if you want this slide. Um, but just to say that I would see that the intractable conflict um, ideas, the core defining features of, of intractable conflict fit quite well in the Rakhine sense. About to click going forward, people are taking their photo. <laughs> um, but I'd say that all of the defining features really do fit the Myanmar context. Okay. Um, so the relevance of this is that if, this is, if my analysis there is true, is that this conflict on all sides is being driven by these historical narratives and we cannot dismiss this history too lightly to focus on the proximal and the, and the recent uh, and, and expect that the underlying issues are going to be resolved. But also that this um, results in collective emotional orientations. For example, the Rohingya. The Rohingya have long lived with fear and humiliation at their marginalisation, at their lack of citizenship, at the continual disenfranchisement. But I would say that in the last year or so, particularly after the 2007 uh, August um, crackdown, that they turned, that turned to outright terror and despair, which is why, having, having not fled across the border in large numbers previously, suddenly two thirds of the population in Myanmar got up and left in a matter of weeks. Um, because, yeah, um, that, that collective emotional orientation um, just switched one, 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 one level further. The ethnic Rakhine, who have long felt a sense of angst that their future was being compromised by an influx or population growth of Muslims, and anger at Burmese domination has turned to outright fear. Um, and I think that they, they are feeling a really deep sense of fear from both sides and the international community at the moment. And the Burmans, by which I, I, I guess I'm coding military uh, and maybe government to some extent, have, um, I'd say, long lived under a sense of a siege mentality that the world is against them uh, and the world doesn't understand their unique challenges. Um, and again, I think particularly in the face of the militant attacks by ASA, that has turned to a really deep sense of fear, which I, in many senses explains the, the, the degree of violence that they displayed uh, against the, the Rohingya. A couple of quick points before I hand over to Costas here. In terms of demographics, 
Um, there's, a lot, um, there's a lot made of the high birth rate of the Muslims, particularly of the Rohingya inside Myanmar, and a lot of policy making has been arguing that the Rohingya have a particularly high birth rate. But data analysis, and this isn't our analysis, I've, I've borrowed this from, from uh, other researchers, I can give you the name if you'd like, would suggest that the Rohingya do have a much higher birth rate than the ethnic Bama or than the ethnic Rakhine do, would be on the bottom of the graph, but are actually quite similar to other, other groups that have had less service provision in terms of health and education, um, like the Chin or the Kiyin or Kiya, um, which I think is quite really quite important um, to, to note. Their population growth is not out of control as much as they haven't had the service delivery. Um, the second thing is to note their current demographics um, or recent demographics. The Rakhine have brought their population growth under control with their increased education and, and healthcare. Uh, and as you'll see, the under, uh, so these are these are age groups. So the under fours, are, there's less under fours or under fives than there are under tens, and there are less under tens than there are, are under 15s. But you'll see that's that's reversed um, in the uh, the Rohingya population that are continuing to grow. The point there being that even um, even if they brought their birth rate down now, the the proportionality of the two populations is going to change in the years ahead. Um, and if you look back, over, you, this is just a quick slide to highlight the growth of the Muslim population in the northern portion of Rakhine over the last 150 odd years, uh, or 100 years up until independence. And so this idea that the Muslim population has been growing through migration has some merit. Um, and so I just want to highlight, the, I guess, the fact that the fears that are driving the, the ethnic Rakhine are not completely unfounded and need to be, need to be appreciated and dealt with somehow in, in everything else that needs to be dealt with. Um, final slide, um, and I'm not going to talk through all the numbers, but that's the current situation as of earlier this year. Um, Buditang Mangthor have largely been, been depopulated, uh, in, uh, and, and you see the numbers that are crossed across into Bangladesh. Um, there's an there's estimated maximum 250,000 Rohingya left in the, the whole of northern Rakhine, uh, and about 200, uh, sorry, about 300,000 left in north central Rakhine. So there's now more Muslims in those areas. Uh, intermingled in villages um, with Buddhists. And I, but, but the fact that there are still probably 600,000 in the country means that we should not lose sight of the fact that there's a lot that could and should be done to stabilise those relations, as well as talking about the population across the border. Costas. So uh, in the next part of, uh, of our analysis, we try to apply some theoretical approaches that uh, have been present in the literature for the past 20, 25 years in order to see whether we can make and how we can make sense of the situation. So the first one is uh, the so-called ethnic security dilemma that draws uh, heavily from international relations theory. So the classical understanding of the security dilemma uh, argues that in international politics, because uh, there is anarchy, uh, it is a self-help system, states feel insecure and in order to maximize the security of their own citizens, they try to maximize their power in order to protect their citizens. And this builds mutual distrust be between states and it can lead to escalation and war. By the same token, in, in the early 1990s, they tried to understand what happened in Yugoslavia. So Barry Posen tried to transfer this model and talk instead of states about ethnic groups during transition phases. And the, base, the basic argument back then was that um, when a country uh, is in some form of transition, either uh, it's failing or it, it experiences a democratic transition, but anyway, it is in a transformative phase, there is an increased level of insecurity because nobody can guarantee to the ethnic groups what's going to happen. That increases the in-group solidarity and the out-group enmity. And the result is that each group sees the other building up Trying, becoming more hostile from their own perspective. They try to do the same, they retaliate basically, and that gradually can lead to violence. Uh, sometimes this is informed also by uh, the geographic isolation of ethnic groups as well. So the lack of, uh, of uh, communication and contact with other ethnic groups may um, exacerbate that problem. Uh, one thing that I, th one important element that we need, I think, to take out from today's presentation has to do with the, with how the ethnic security dilemma plays emphasis on the lack of communication. So, for some of the scholars in that field of studies, uh, the lack of communication, not only between the groups, but within the group, from the top to bottom, from the elites to the masses of the of the collectivity 
The lack of communication creates insecurity. It maximizes insecurity. Mixed signaling may maximize insecurity as well. And for us, it was quite interesting to see that although this should be easily addressed uh, after the introduction of the social media in, uh, in, uh, in Myanmar, so opening up the space basically for more communication, the problem is that although the volume of communication between the groups, if you like, increased, the quality of the communication decreased rapidly and it led to hate speech. So it's not just an outcome of just opening the space of communication, but you need to make sure that there is some kind of effective communication between the groups and within the groups as well. Um, as uh, Anthony pointed out, the demographic element is quite strong with the security dilemma. Uh, the, narrative that quite, the narrative that we came across time and again during our war was uh, especially from the Rakhine Buddhist and the Burmese uh, Buddhist perspective, the uh, overpopulation of the Muslim element in the region and the fear that they are going to take over. And as we said, demographics may confirm that, but on the other hand, clearly there are ways how this demographic can, be, can, can change, especially with the increase of development and the change in the, um, in the demographics through uh, the different paths uh, to uh, development. Uh, so, the problem here, I think that I run fast ahead myself here, so this is the slide I was talking about earlier, but I'm going to leave it for, for a few seconds. Uh, However, the security, the ethnic security dilemma may offer some insights about why we had cycles of violence, but clearly it does not explain the whole situation in its totality. Um, and that makes us to move further and try to find other theoretical models in order to add uh, 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 to our interpretation. So, we decided to move to the economic aspects of, of the conflict because this has been floated around uh, time and again about uh, uh, the economic drivers of the conflict and the, and the fact that um, uh, uh, there is some structural, economic structural changes that pushes uh, the local populations and dislocate local populations. Uh, the first, the first uh, uh, theory that we uh, decided to examine was the great thesis. Uh, that, that theory was quite popular about 20 years ago, uh, especially within the context of Africa. To cut a very long story short, because we, we discussed that at length in the book, uh, the main argument that has been put forward by, uh, by some scholars was that poverty, necessarily and unavoidably, extreme poverty, may lead to violence. And the explanation for this correlation is because life is very cheap. So those who don't have a future, those who don't have anything to lose, basically, in economic terms, they can be mobilized easier, they can take up arms in order to pursue a better future through mobilization, through violence. Uh, so it was, as I said, quite popular, quite popular with uh, major donors as well for, for several years. So we decided to see how this can play out in the, in the situation in Rakhine. Uh, it is true that significant resources exist, and uh, there are some me what we call mega projects in the region. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we cannot we could not establish any clear correlation between uh, the Arakan Army or the uh, Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army uh, mobilization and poverty. Uh, first of all, despite the fact that uh, Rakhine State is the second poorest in Myanmar. Would, which would mean that definitely the mobilization rates should be higher, so the popularity of recruiting and joining uh, the armed fractions would be higher, we haven't seen anything like that. Uh, Arakan army is popular in words, but not in deeds, so there is a lot of popularity, popularity of the Arakan army within the Rakhine population, but not actual recruitment, high levels of actual recruitment. And the same stands for uh, ARSA as well. Um, so moving, moving uh, further to, to that, what we have m probably managed to establish is that there may be some predatory elements of, uh, of the grid thesis on behalf of the Burmese state, especially associated with uh, uh, the mega projects 
around around um, Chopko or the Mongdo area as well. But again, we cannot suggest that it is a clear case of a struggle for primitive accumulation by economic or capitalist forces that try to push uh, the populations out. It may be a factor, it may be a contributive factor, but surely it's not the main factor that causes uh, the conflict. And uh, as uh, I, su I suggested earlier, we couldn't establish any strong causal links between poverty and mobilization in Rakhine. So from this point of view, it's very difficult to think or to suggest that um, rationality prevails in the decision making of the actors, uh, at least in the way that some scholars in the world would expect rationality to operate in this kind of environment. Uh, again, it may, it may offer some insights, it may offer some ideas, but clearly it cannot hold a universal value for the case of Rakhine. So moving, moving to the next economic approach, it's the political economy approach, which places emphasis more on the, on the mega projects and the um, structural conditions and capitalist forces that uh, uh, push forward for change and accumulation of capital in the case of Rakhine. Uh, however, and moving, moving to, into Rakhine, uh, with the exception of the Mongto economic zone, which is a recent development of during the past year, the places where this economic activity has taken place and the, and the locus of the violent incidents do not coincide. If there was a drive to dislocate people because, say, the Bama state, the, the, the Burmese government wanted to place a mega economic project on that particular land, then it would be a close correlation between the locus of the incident and the locus of the development project. And this, with, as I said, with the exception of the Hmong we don't know what's going to happen on that, on that front, doesn't hold water. So we're moving next to discuss about um, identity uh, and uh, ethnic conflict. And here things become a little bit more perplexed in the sense that we need to as we, have seen, as we have done in the first part of the book, we need to see the historical projection and the role of the state as uh, the agent that can form social identities historically, not only in Rakhine, but globally. We need to see uh, the wider narratives about political organization that has taken place over the past 200 years, nearly 200 years uh, globally, the role of the colonization period, what was the contribution of the, of the colonial era to the formation of identities. And we try to demonstrate that although there is, uh, there is a lot of credibility to the argument about how important in terms of influence was the colonial era by introducing terms and concepts like ethnicity or nation in a very strict sense, which actually transcended the previously established social categories in the region. However, we cannot reduce the whole argument about identity formation only to the colonial era. Uh, at, the same, at the same time, uh, we go through the evolution of Tainta, of ethnicity, as a very core element for the Myanmar uh, identity and how, especially after Nguyen took, took over, uh, attempted to place emphasis on the idea of ethnicities as static ethnic groups and how many ethnicities are there present in Myanmar in order, if you like, to lock up, how, to lock in how many ethnic groups may be allowed in the country. But this, even if we accept that this is the process, this is what happened, this is in tune with wider political developments, not only in the region, but globally around the idea and, if you like, the relation between nationality and political identity. So, in many parts of the world, to be a member of the political community, you need to qualify in national or ethnic terms. So, Myanmar, in that particular case, it's not an exception, it rather follows a mega trend, a historical trend in global politics. 
And at the moment, we haven't escaped from this trend. Still, we think and talk along ethnic and national lines as the core of the political community in several countries in the world. Uh, <clears throat> However, what is important to note is that we need to move from an understanding of ethnic groups as static and from an understanding of ethnic conflict as the class of two concrete blocks, two concrete entities, and try to see ethnicity as a set of social relations, which are dynamic in character and they can transform. And why this is important? Because only if we see ethnicity and ethnic identity in this sense, we open up the space for some intracommunal understanding, for building, for the building of associational links between the different so-called ethnic groups. If we see them statically, then everyone is locked in. If we see them as a set of relationships, then there is space for the dynamic transformation of what we call the political community in Myanmar. And because I'm running out of time, I think. Uh, now, so I'm going to give the floor to Anthony for the concluding remarks. <laughs> So we've run through some of the academic analysis that we included in the book to looking at the various theories that are, are floated in the academic world as to what leads conflict, because conflict's a normal human condition, but what takes conflict and, and turns it violent? Um, and so I guess in a summary uh, of what Costas has just covered, the ethnic security dilemma, yes, almost, or in, there's lots of elements of that, that that contribute to our understanding. The greed thesis really doesn't fit. The, Political economy, there's aspects, but it's not a, not a good fit. And it really does come back to boiling down to ideas about identity and ideas about ethnicity, um, and hence those historical narratives, I guess. Kofi Annan, um, just rounding off now in terms of um, implications of our analysis back on what international actors should be doing today. So Kofi Annan uh, released his report um, in August last year, and this is a, a summary of some of the biggest recommendations um, that, that he put forth in terms of the most difficult to, to implement. Several of them, the government, I mean, all of them, the government, Myanmar government has said they are committed to impl implementing all of the recommendations of the report as the security situation allows. And obviously things have changed a lot since then. Um, uh, but we see moves to close the IDP camps. We, we um, see just this past week the appointment of the Independent um, Investigation Commission. We'll see how that quite pans out. But you know the Filipino uh, and, and Japanese um, you know, key people on that, uh, Professor Ong Tun Thet um, on, on that, someone that personally I, I have a, a good deal of stock in. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, but some of these other recommendations, you know, uh, the idea, of, for example, of monitoring security forces at, their, at all the checkpoints with CCTV uh, to, to monitor how they, how they perform. When they, when, I mean, that's, that's almost in, in the realm of pipe dream, you know. But there were some good ideas in, in Kofi Annan's report, and I would suggest it is the best ideas um, to, this, to date. And central to that, I think is actually number three, based on our analysis. If there's one that's, that stands out above all else, I'd say this idea, number three on my list, not his, um, is the idea that the, the linkage in the Burmese thinking and, in the, and, and even in the constitution between citizenship and ethnicity has to be removed, uh, as well as removing different classes of citizenship um, and, and all citizens are citizens with equal rights and, and citizenship is not based on ethnicity, it's based on, on a, a general eligibility criteria as an individual. Uh, and they are central, I think, to the problems. Our analysis, though, we would throw up a few more additional implications um, than are in the Kofi Annan report. And I'm going to allow you to read the report rather than trying to summarise that to you. We do, in the, in the, in the book, um, a, a, you know, work, work through much of the Kofi Annan report. Um, but I would suggest these. Firstly, we must protect the assets and the economic interests of the Muslims while they're not there, or there is no future, a shared future looking forward for around any sort of return. Um, they must return, the, the Muslims must, you know, the Rohingya must return quickly to avoid land grabbing and loss of economic opportunity and things moving forward, but they can't until they're given, given rights and security guarantees. So we're in this real catch-22. It, it is urgent. I'd say it is, it is very urgent and yet there aren't the preconditions in place at this point in time, um, which is very problematic. 
Um, I'd say, say that the international community, we need to do a lot more to show solidarity with all victims. Well, I think we've shown a fair degree of solidarity with, with the Muslims, particularly those who have fled, those who have remained less so, and, and the ethnic Rakhine and other um, ethnicities in the country, I think we've shown very little solidarity with, and I think that needs to be recognised that, that uh, Attacks by a militant group like ASA on state security installations is an acceptable way to resolve the conflict, even if we can empathise where that, where that might have come from. Um, the state, including the government, must acknowledge that it is an actor. It is not a neutral mediator in a peripheral dispute between local ethnicities. They are a, a, an integral actor, and I've not heard the government in any way, nor the Anand report suggests that the government is an actor and that the military, you know, beyond the military, that the, the state is an actor in this conflict. We need to support the NLD in their struggle with the military, and I think that they are locked in a power struggle in Rakhine uh, for control. Uh, and I see signs of both sides winning small victories, but I think there's a big behind-the-scenes power struggle going on. Um, we need to plan for the fact that even if the, if the Rohingya do come back, the demographics are going to con continue to shift for another generation and it's going to, going to continue to rub um, very badly. This is a long-term um, issue that, that needs re resolution. need to figure out a way to deal with the name Rohingya because really, why can't people name themselves? Um, uh, it, you know, um, the, uh, but, but particularly, we need to empathise with those emotional responses um, of the, 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 the Burmese state, the, the, the military and the, um, the government, uh, as well as the local Buddhists. Whether we agree with it or not, the first chance, the, the, the first thing in trying to get, I mean, we need the military, we need the government, we need the local Buddhists on side in any, any, in any resolution that's actually going to have a chance of lasting. And, and the, first start, the first place for us as, as an international community in that is to recognise their fears and the validity of the fear, even if, even if we disagree that it's likely to happen, um, the, the, the fear is a very real response and I think we need to empathise with that. Uh, and then finally on this slide, um, that, that there is a, a requirement really to highlight and to build a sense of shared history because the history is being what is used at the moment to mobilise and socialise to the conflict. Um, history becomes a potential tool, particularly since there is so much of, a, of history of Muslims in their history. Final warning we'd like to leave you with, this is the final slide, is, is, a, is the question. Why did Asa attack? the very night that the, the Kofi Annan report was made public? And I think this is a big question in many people's minds. It's not that they didn't, I mean, yes, they'd planned the attack ahead of time and, and that date had already been chosen. They were trying to make a very symbolic statement clearly about something. But um, the, the contents of the report were fairly well known. There'd already been an interim report and Kofi Annan and others had already signalled almost uh, much of what was in the report. It was known that, that what he was recommending what, and what the report was going to recommend were, was going a long way to the claims that the Muslims, that the Rohingya were making. Why would you look, choose that night of all nights to launch an, an all out, well, a, a major attack on the state um, and almost certainly scuttle implementation of that? And I want to suggest that perhaps the sense that they had the international community behind them, but if they went to the extreme and there was a real blow up, they'd get even more international support, may well have been playing into the thinking of, um, of ASA. And if that is true as a, a, a warning of a moral hazard risk, then our next steps are vital um, and, and the way we respond has a potential to end up putting more people in harm, not just um, necessarily helping to resolve the conflict. Yeah, actually, um, when we were, we, were hit with, we were writing the book and we were hit with the news about you know, what was happening in August 2017. And then immediately uh, we started talking with, with Anthony, you know, what's going on? I mean, everybody was expecting a very real a positive outcome from the Annan report that was positive. Why? Why they did that? Why? So we decided to go back to the literature, check other cases, and we end up with some analysis that fits back to the Yugoslav conflict again, where there was evidence, strong, there was back then strong evidence that uh, because of the uh, keenness of the uh, international community to step in and do something, that was sending the wrong signaling to the rebels. 
So instead, the rebels sitting in the negotiation table were pushing their people into harm's way in order to generate humanitarian crisis and drag the international community into a humanitarian intervention to their own benefit. It's, it's quite paradoxical, but this is what, what happened and it has been evidenced quite clearly. So we thought that, you know, as we're concluding the book, it's quite important, especially in lighting what happened in August 2017, to, to register that, to say that, okay, that's quite important and we have to register that this is a very serious risk. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for a really interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, also, I think the parallels you've, you've drawn and uh, some of the contradictions that arise even in, well, anybody who has tried to do any work at research or articles on Rakhine, you're always hit with, um, uh, you know, diabolical contradictions. And as you say, on one hand, you've said this is an intractable conflict. At the same time, half your book is about how to solve it. Um, but presumably, if it's intractable, it's... Um, so one... Um, one has to consider that, and I'd be interested in what our discussants uh, feel about whether it is uh, intractable or solvable. Um, but can I just, to recap, um, I think also for the discussants, um, what's interesting is, is um, the assertions about uh, the, score, the causes, especially um, the author's assertion that it's not about uh, pure ethnic cleansing or denial of citizenship. Um, that there is a commonality uh, with other ethnic groups um, and which relates to a much deeper issue uh, and also about these misconceptions that you've drawn very, very clearly, very interesting and um, quite right on, on some levels. Um, and this issue that you uh, characterised, Anthony, as central being uh, identity, Rohingya identity, um, when they arrived uh, is what you see as a central issue. Some see it as irrelevant because we've seen a, a massive crime against humanity, so therefore, does it really matter when they went, or even if some of them just came across the border like 50 years ago or 10 years ago? Anyway, that's, um, that's on the human rights side. So um, I'll leave my comments to that and um, begin with you.